Chapter 13 of Luke, it's kind of a powerful one. I know I say that every week, but um, it feels like whenever Jesus is talking, it's powerful. Now, on the occasion, there were some present who reported to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So this would be a horrible situation to have the sacrifices made to God and the Romans mixing the sacrifice with, with human blood. And, and Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that the 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Why do bad things happen? It's basically the question here. Now, you have to know a little background. Pontius Pilate, he was assigned to oversee the Jewish nation. He was um, a bad guy, and he didn't like the Jews. Remember I told you how the Caesar respected the Jews' faith? Well, he didn't share the boss's opinion about the Jews. And when he came to reign, he brought the Roman emblems into Jerusalem and the, was such a big riot and he was ready to kill everybody and then he realized they were ready to die. So he decided to move the, the emblems down the road. But um, he would take money from the offering in the temple and use it to build aqueducts. This was God's money, not for him to be messing with. Um, a crowd would gather to protest, and then he would put soldiers in civilian clothing with concealed weapons, and then at the right moment, they would unleash violence on the crowd and kill all kinds of innocent people. Okay, so the Jews didn't like Pilate, and Pilate didn't like the Jews. And now he's messing with their offering. Okay, this is just bad. This is uh, real bad. And so when they ask him about Pilate, once again, it's always a trick question. Because if he in any way tries to understand what Pilate is doing, he's affirming Pilate, and then the people will hate him. If he attacks Pilate, he'll be reported to the Romans as a revolutionary. Just a subtle way to try to get Jesus in trouble. And Jesus, he takes the question to a higher level. Okay. Why do bad things happen? Now, you notice some were Galileans. You have to know, Galileans, that would have been like a hick town. You know how we might say those folks over in uh, Kissimmee? <laughs> Just messing around. I have a Kissimmee uh, zip code. But uh, you know what I'm talking about. The people on the south side. There's folks out in California. Wherever it might be, you know, well, they, though, they, they, they get what's coming to them. We have this way of just identifying people as getting what they, what they deserve. And, and really, human tragedies are not necessarily divine punishments. A lot of times we think that it is, but... Um, I actually got this question last night when I was coming home from the gym. Somebody wanted to know, is this, does God punish people? And I said, well, I think all punishment was taken care of on the cross with Jesus. Okay? If God was out there punishing sin all the time, all of us would be hurting. Because we're all sinners. Job's friends, they made the mistake when they asserted that Job's problems were evidence that he was a sinner. What do we know about Job? God was bragging about him because he wasn't a sinner. Okay? And he doesn't do tit for tat. He's a grace-filled, forgiving God. Is suffering punishment from God? It's a story about William Barclay. He's a Scottish um, 
Bible translator, theologian, and his daughter died in a boating accident. And so somebody wrote him a letter saying, the reason your daughter died is because God killed her because of your heresy. See, his heresy is that he doesn't believe in miracles. Okay, he's written these commentaries. They're great pieces of spiritual insight, scriptural insight. But his theology is when the feeding of the 5,000, everybody was so moved by Jesus' words that they all started sharing their lunches too. Okay. Well, I don't think that's the way it happened. But you know what? I don't think that that's why his daughter died in a boating accident. God doesn't do that. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we assume that he does. It's funny because Barclay said the same thing that John Wesley stated. Uh, your God is my devil. Okay. When we have that God that we say, God's going to get you. You know what? No, the devil's going to get you. God's the one who puts a hedge of protection around you. God's the one who's so patient with you. Have you ever had to look back on your journey and go, oh my goodness. I said that and he forgave me. I did that and he overlooked it. I continue to get it wrong and he's very patient as I, he points out how to get it right. But we don't have a God who just wants to slap you, but Jesus is holding his hand back. No. We have a God that knew you had sin problems, took care of it on the cross. It's kind of a weird story. The rabbi said to the tailor, did you go to church today? Confess your sins? The tailor says, yeah, I went to the church today and I confessed my sins. I confess that I cheat on a on a yard of cloth on occasion and I told God let's make a deal I cheat on a, a yard of cloth you let little babies die so I'll forgive your big sins if you forgive my little sins whoa I don't know about you but that's not the way my confession goes with God okay but what he was really saying is why does God allow bad things to happen why does God allow bad things to happen? I'm going to tell you something that's really cool for me. The typhoon that hit the Philippines. Do you know that it was a Muslim holiday over there? And so most people were not in a spot where they would get hurt. I was so happy to realize that people got out of harm's way. For, it was an earthquake, excuse me. I'm, I said the typhoon, I meant an earthquake. Uh, a big earthquake happened, 7.2. And um, I remember rejoicing, oh, wow. You know, it was a Muslim holiday. Praise God, you know. I was happy that there wasn't a loss of life. You know, instead of saying, well, Muslims? No. God cares about them. He likes them. He loves them. Heard a wild story. What's today? Thursday? Tuesday. This guy is telling me he's Jewish. He's in Dubai. He has a friend who's one of those billionaires, sheiks. And um, he says, why do you Westerners always blame us when something goes wrong? And his, he'd never told his friend that he was Jewish. He goes, well, you know what? Same thing happens to my people. I'm Jewish. And he's taking a big step. And the sheik-ish guy says, you're a child of Abraham also. I knew that I liked you. And gave him a big hug. And it just melted my heart to see that that kind of connection and love. You know, we're so used to hearing stories of violence and hatred. And you know what? It's not that way all the time. So where was I? Sorry. I had this fun story when the, the blind English poet John Milton, remember Paradise Lost? That we all pretended that we read, but it was so hard to read that we read the cliff notes instead. He's old and obscure, and he was visited by Charles II, son of the king that the Puritans had beheaded. 
And so the, the son of the king says, your blindness is a judgment from God for the part you took against my father. And Milton replied, if I have lost my sight through God's judgment, what can you say of your father who lost his head? Okay. You should never try to match wits with a, a, a intelligent author. So why does God allow stuff to happen? Well, let's think out loud. If God was to control everything, then we would not have free will, right? If God was to control everything, um, we would be robots. We invited sin into the world, and God immediately put into motion a plan to save us from sin. Okay? But now we have to deal with the consequences. We might say, well, why do I have to deal with Adam and Eve's sin? I wouldn't have made that choice. You still make bad choices today? End of conversation. Okay? You would have made that choice because that's what free will does. Okay? We make the wrong choices. And it's only when we're under the Holy Spirit's influence that we make the right choices. Well, Jesus does something powerful. He says, what about all those people out there that, 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 that died? He says, you know what? What about you? You need to repent or the same thing could happen to you. We always have this way of doing the hypothetical. What about them? And Jesus says, let's talk about you. And he says, you need to be spiritually ready. And what does it mean to be spiritually ready? We need to produce fruit. You'll notice that the very next story is about a fig tree. The guy says, why is it even taking up space on the ground? It's not producing fruit. And the, the gardener says, let me give it a little more um, um, fertilizer, and then we'll cut it down. Okay. God expects fruit from your life. You know, we're in such a, such a habit of saying, Lord, bless me, protect me, care for me, give me. And we forget that there's a responsibility and an obligation and a calling attached to our faith. We're supposed to be sharing our faith and bringing people to know the Lord. Okay? Um, when the tsunami hits, when the bus comes along, when the cancer arrives, are you ready? Or are you going to be one of those people that was just taking up space? Are you going to leave any contributions? Or will you look back and say, well, I wish I would have. How come I forgot to do this? God wants to move through you, even you. You might say, I'm a nobody. You're a somebody in your sphere of influence, and you're somebody special when the Lord God gets a hold of you. Well, it's kind of powerful. The next story is this woman is, um, she's in church, and she had for 18 years a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. And Jesus sees her and he says, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he lays hands on her and immediately she stands up. And the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus healed on the Sabbath, said, there are six days in which work could be done, so come on them to get healed, not on the Sabbath. Now, I don't know if you've ever said something stupid, but this would be something stupid to say. Basically, he's saying... You know what? <clears throat> um, healing from God's not going to happen here in church. Well, if it's not going to happen in church, I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to that church then. I don't want to go and hear a, a collection of words. I don't want to go and receive a, a good story. I, I want to go where there's power, where the Lord shows up, where something can happen, where prayers get answered, where Jesus is. And friends, where Jesus is, Power is available. He can fix your bad attitude. He can take away your bad habits. He can change the dynamics in your world. He does healing. Sometimes he doesn't. He does lift our burdens. Sometimes he leaves them there so we'll stay in dependence upon him. But always in that relationship, he's on the move in your life. I think it's interesting that it says that this woman was afflicted by Satan and she's bent over. 
Do you realize that your sins can cause pain in your life? There's stories of people who had withered hands and, and, and they went to church and they, they released a, an unforgiveness that they'd held for years and their hands straightened out. Well, I mean, what's that all about? That's the power of Satan holding you like this. And I wonder how many of us have withered hearts, withered thought processes, because we haven't allowed God just to come into our heads and bring healing. We've allowed Satan to have that little grip of fear in our lives. And so our lives are dominated by fear-based decisions rather than trusting God and taking risks and going on an adventure of faith. Well, let's get back to this preacher. Found this, I don't know, kind of fun quote. Um, it says this. Can't find it. It's fun, though, okay? Trust me. Let me keep rolling. Verse 22. Ask a question that I think we get to hear a lot. Verse 22. He's passing through, and the disciples say, <clears throat> um, I'm so sorry. A little embarrassed. Here it is. Lord, are there just a few who are going to be saved? Who's going to be saved? Who's going to heaven? Okay. And I don't know about you, but I have my criterion. But that criterion's changed over the years. When I was a young man, if you had the right doctrine, okay, well then you would be saved. And it really wasn't about any of your lifestyle. As long as you knew the formula that Jesus died for your sins, then you would be saved. Other people will come along and say, well, look, you know, if you're not living the life, it doesn't really matter what you believe, because if you believe it, you're going to live it. And if you're not living it, then it nullifies what you believe, and you're not going to make it to heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm trying to live it, and I would have some areas that I'm not doing so well in. And so then I would worry that I'm not going to make it to heaven, and I would live in a constant state of fear of God, because I couldn't get rid of the sin of my life. Okay, so I wasn't going to heaven for a long, lots of my faith journey when I was a young man. I didn't think I was going to make it. I was trying, I was getting everybody else saved, but I didn't think I was going to make it. Okay. Then I encountered this thing called grace. Whoa. And, and you can test this out. Ask people, if you die tonight, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And, and a lot of times they'll say yes, and you'll say why, and they'll say because I'm a good person. No, you're not good enough for the standards of God. All are sinners and all fall short of the glory of God. And that's why Jesus came, because you couldn't make it to God. The only way you get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And it's kind of interesting because um, they, they're doing the theoretical thing again. You know, who gets saved? And that's when Jesus gets real personal. Okay? Once again, strive to enter by the narrow gate. For the way is wide and broad that leads to destruction, and many will find it. That's in, in uh, Matthew chapter 7. Okay? And he says many will seek to enter, but they can't. And how is it that people want to get there? Well, they want to get there and they don't get there, I think, because a lot of folks aren't hearing the message today. I read this fascinating piece. Apparently, there's a woman who's doing a circuit through liberal churches. She's got a bunch of tattoos. She's a buffed-out weightlifter, and, and she swears in her sermons. Now, I know some of you do a little swearing under your breath while I'm preaching, but I try not to let any of that out while I'm preaching. She lets it out. She uses it in her sermons. And so, as you can imagine, it causes a stir. You're not supposed to preach. The Bible says that's 
that's not the right way to talk, period, far less preach the gospel. So she's swearing, and everybody's having a big, you know, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And she says, well, here's what's going on. The gospel's supposed to make you uncomfortable. So she's making people uncomfortable. Actually, all kinds of people like it, and everybody's showing up. They're excited to hear somebody, the swearing preacher, all right? So I'm thinking about adding this to my repertoire. Now, the Bible says, and Paul says, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, then I shouldn't eat meat. And if a swearing is going to cause people to stumble, then maybe we shouldn't swear. Good idea? Makes sense to me. Or maybe she's trying to reach out to a demographic that nobody else is reaching out to. Okay? Maybe this is an unconventional method. I'll tell you what's kind of funny is somebody comes up to Dwight L. Moody and they say, you know, we don't like the way, we don't like your, your evangelism methods. He goes, I don't like them either. Tell me what kind you have. He goes, well, um, I, I don't have any. He goes, well, I, don't, I like mine better than yours. Okay? Are you telling anybody about the Lord? Are, are you telling anybody? I know I had a conversation this week with somebody that said, I don't believe in sin. I said, well, tell me about it. Well, I believe in consequences. He said, well, you know, I'll tell you what. I was kind of not really believing in hell anymore, and then I got to this spot where I was reading about um, human trafficking stories and the way these children are just absolutely brutalized. And I realized, oh, yes, yeah, I hope there's a hell. Okay? I know it's the wrong thing to say. Don't, don't write me a letter. But it just hurts to see these people brutalizing children. And I go, so somebody's consequence here, somebody made a decision based on a sinful decision, and it got passed down, and, you know, I, I could see that by me engaging him, he was rethinking his concept of sin. And that's all I was trying to do. Do you get into those conversations? Are you causing people to rethink their perspective on God? Because everybody has these theories, especially the non-Christians. You know what I think about God? You know, hear it all the time. And, and, and don't make fun of them like I just did. Pay attention. And if you can't answer it right then, take notes and come back to your friend and say, hey, you know, remember when you said this? I was thinking about. And then come up with an answer. Because, you know, they were just woofing off. They found a comfortable place to dismiss God in their lives. You come back and make that a little bit uncomfortable, and not in a judgmental way, but with love and concern and interest and intellectual curiosity. And guess what? Now you've got a spiritual conversation going on. And somebody who was not walking with the Lord is now going to walk with the Lord. And that's a good thing. You know, people come into my office all the time. You know, I want to talk about predestination. I don't believe in it. You know, or they want to talk about election. They want to talk about all these theological concepts. And it's so weird because when you want to talk about their prayer life or when you want to talk about their devotional life or when you want to talk about them leading people to Jesus or their involvement in the church, suddenly they don't want to talk anymore. Because there's these, these folks out there that they're, they're all about theology, but their theology never makes it into their lifestyle. And Jesus didn't say, do you know the five main tenets of Christianity? No, he said, when did I see you hungry and thirsty and in need of clothing and hurting? You know, Jesus... He was interested in a lifestyle of love, not a lifestyle of doctrine. Now, I'm not saying that doctrine is not important. Obviously, it is. Because the wrong doctrine can lead you. We have friends who are Mormons. We have friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses. We have friends who are all kinds of different things, okay? And here's something important. They don't see Jesus as God. He is a God, but he's not equal with God, okay? 
Now, once you start messing with the identity of Jesus, now you're disempowering the guy that took care of your sin problem. Okay? Now you are lowering him from where he was supposed to be. Now I'm not trying to pick a fight with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. Again, I got friends and we argue about things all the time. And believe me, I pointed this out to them. And they usually start it, though, I want to tell you. They start the theological fights with me first. But once you start messing with the identity of Jesus, you're stripping away his authority to tell you what to do, his authority to lead you into the paths of righteousness and abundant life and eternal life. You're stripping him away from the power to move. Okay, so doctrine's important is what I'm trying to say. Some people don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Wow, we're going through Luke right now. How many times have we seen the Holy Spirit? All the time. Okay, doctrine's important. But take a doctrinal person who knows everything and compare him to somebody who doesn't know much but is serving and loving everybody all the time. I'm telling you, the person that's serving and loving all the time, that's that's the one who's going to do the most fruit for the kingdom. And so what I'm saying it was doctrinal people, are you putting it into practice? Are you touching anybody's life? You know, I think most of us were beyond measuring every word that comes out of somebody's mouth to see if they have the right theology. Trust me, we probably all have it wrong somewhere. You know, the Presbyterians got it wrong this way, the Baptists that way, the Methodists another way. But together, we're right about one thing. The Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And the more we focus on him, the more we're going to find, we're going to make fewer mistakes when we're, we're focused on him and walking with him and, and, and living with him. And, and I'll, let's get into a tough spot because in our passage, this is what Jesus says. He says, um, enter through the narrow door. Many, I tell you, will seek to enter and they're not going to be able to, to they're not going to be able to, um, folks, folks are going to come and, and the house is going to shut the door and they're going to stand outside and say, Lord, let us in. And he's going to say, I do not know where you are from. But we ate and we drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. I tell you, I don't know where you're from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I know it's not kosher to talk about weeping and gnashing of teeth because you know where that place is? Hell. And, you know, you talk about, I'm telling you, go out there and start talking about hell and people will tune you out. Not a great way to start evangelizing today. Okay? Don't use hell. Bring the love of God. You know, I remember the young me, hey, my friend, you know what? If you don't know God, you're going to burn in hell forever. And that worked in the 70s. Today, they just go, oh, whatever. Instead, I come up, hey, my friend, do you know that the, the God's available to move in your life? Really? That works. Well, well, you're selling out. I'm not selling out anything. I'm just choosing to bring this piece of theology first, and hell will come along later. Okay? Maybe he doesn't even need to come along. You meet a God and find out that he loves you, find out that he's alive. You know, and people say, oh, how do you know? I say, well, I can tell you that I honestly see him moving. So why don't you give it a shot and see what happens? Okay? Boom. What a positive way to bring some, to raise the question. And then you start praying that the Lord will bring other people in. You start praying, God, help me keep this conversation going. You start lifting that person before the Lord, and things are going to happen because your God is real, and he's going to honor you stepping out with your faith. And this whole weeping of gnashing the teeth. When do we gnash our teeth? Here, give me a, somebody give me a gnash right now. Isn't it, isn't it one you regret? Isn't that when you bring your mouth together and go, oh. 
because you look back and realize all those opportunities I had and I missed it. Why did you miss it? Because you weren't looking where you should have been looking. You know, I forgot to tell you about the mustard seed. Just a stupid little story. Here's the problem. I did all my homework in my other Bible, and it's in different places, and so I'm looking down, and it's supposed to be over here, and I've got to go find it over there. Um, what is the kingdom of God like? It's just like a mustard seed. He throws it into the garden. It's this little tiny seed, and the next thing you know, it overwhelms the garden. You bring Jesus into your life, and, and, and does he expand in your world, or you keep him in a little compartment? Because he's supposed to expand and he's supposed to move into your marriage and move into your children's parenting style. He's supposed to move into your work. Move into your head so that you think positive instead of critically. Joyful instead of angry. Graceful instead of judgmental. He just starts expanding all over your world. Is that happening in your life? Because this is what's going to take place. You're going to be looking back and going, wow, I missed it. And and is there a hell? Well, Jesus talked about it. Do I want anybody to go there? No. Well, maybe those human traffickers. Okay? But I have a feeling that God, who looks at all sin, understands where it came from. And he's willing to work with anybody if we're willing to step out and and, and talk on his behalf. Okay? Well, I'm running out of time here. Um, Always seems to happen to me. Chapter 14. Got to tell you this story. Uh, They invite Jesus to to their house, and and they have a man there suffering from dropsy. This is when your body swells up with fluid. So they have a prop, a human suffering prop. And they're testing Jesus. Because you know what? They know that human suffering can't be in his presence very long without him doing something about it. I think that's kind of a cool thing about Jesus. Could the same thing be said about you and me? That we drive by people who are hurting and go, wow, that's, that's a shame. Jesus would pull over and do something about it. Jesus would put into motion the love of God, the power of God. And that's what he wants us to do on his behalf. And, and it's the same thing. Jesus sees him and, and he asks a question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? You tell me. You, you, you're the one who put this prop here. Is the healing of God okay to happen on Sabbath, church day? And you have to realize Jesus has violated the Sabbath seven times already in Luke. And he tells them this, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into the well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Well, yeah, we're, we're going to do that. And, and if your animals are so important to you, This is somebody who's made in the image of God. Should we not do something to heal and save and restore a person? Is healing and saving and restoring part of your life? I want it to be. I want you to have the thrill of seeing God move through your life. It could be a simple conversation. You know, I'm I'm meeting this guy at the Starbucks regularly now. And first thing, we start joking. Most of them were clean jokes, okay? And we kind of get a friendship going. He doesn't know I'm a pastor. Oh, I can't believe you're a pastor. He finally finds out, you know. And, and the whole time over the weeks, I've been praying. I've been praying, dropping seeds, meeting him at other places, inviting him over to my house for dinner, okay? The whole time. And whether he comes to church or not, I don't know. Obviously, I hope so. Okay? But, but it's an intentional friendship with the spiritual edge. And I want you to be thinking in terms of, here's somebody that I know in my life 
that isn't walking with God. Most people will say, yeah, I believe in God. Okay. But are they walking with God? Are they experiencing His presence? Are they getting their burdens lifted off of their lives? Is the Holy Spirit moving in? Is their life starting to orient around God? Because that's when things come alive. Well, Jesus, I'll, I'll be quick here. He tells them the parable of the guests because everybody's fighting to see who's going to sit in the place of honor. Einstein said, try not to become a, a, a man of success, but a man of values. Everybody's trying to, to, to get to the, the, the front of the table, and, and Jesus says, for everybody who exalts himself will be humbled. And humility, it's kind of a weird thing in Christianity. Humility is not thinking of yourself at all. The moment of you, you say, you know, I feel like I'm kind of a humble guy. <clears throat> right? It's when you're not even thinking about yourself. You're so lost in the Lord, knowing that he's going to cover you and take care of you. Boom. All right? And, and, and he says, instead of inviting all your friends who are going to invite you to their parties, why don't you invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind? Then you're going to get blessed. And, and somebody says, blessed is everyone who eats the bread of the kingdom of God. Says everybody who gets to go to heaven, right? And then Jesus tells the parable. Well, actually, um, a man was given a big dinner. He invited everybody. He said, come. And everybody started to make excuses. I bought a piece of land. I need to go look at it. You know, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to go try them out. Another one says, I'm getting married. In other words, investment, work, and family. Money, career, family. How many times do these things get in the way of our, our journey with God? I think they get in the way a lot. We're invited to a feast, and we don't come because we've got other things to do. And, and, and this is what God says to the Jews. He's telling them, none of these men are, that I've invited are going to taste my dinner. In other words, there's a moment that you can mismanage your spiritual life. Fortunately for you and me, as long as we're breathing, God's going to be extending the invitation. And let's pray for people that the Holy Spirit moves on their hearts. So even if it's a deathbed confession, there's another person in heaven. Okay? But, but I want you to see that the, the kingdom of God, it, it, the, the Christian life, it's a feast, not a funeral. How many people treat it like a funeral? Oh, it's joyful. And I'm almost done. Check it out. He says, if anybody wants to come after me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he can't be a disciple of mine. This always gets people upset. Wait a minute. Are you saying that I have to hate my grandma? Hate your own father and mother? Some of us can say, well, yeah, that's easy. Okay. You know, Americans, we have the idolatry of the family going on big time. Remember when kids used to go to Sunday school, but now they go to soccer and baseball and cheerleading? Um, what if all Christians just said, you know, we don't do that? Those organizations would make adjustments. But we don't. So the kids don't go to church and then they don't go to Sunday school, and they probably don't get supplemented during the week. And guess what happens to the Christian parents' kids? They don't grow up in the faith, and they easily get pulled away by secular rhetoric, and Christian parents don't have Christian children. It's the decisions that we have to make. What does it mean to hate? In comparison of our love for him. That's what it means. But Jesus does get a little extreme, okay? Sometimes we have to choose him over sending our kids to soccer on Sundays. Sometimes we have to choose him over our spouse saying, I don't want to go to church. Sometimes we have to choose him over the family. And, and friends, it gets a little bit weird because you and I, we have to calculate the cost. He says, who, who, who wants to build a tower and doesn't first sit down and, and calculate the cost to see if you have enough to complete it? Do you ever sit down and evaluate your faith? Because so often it's easy just to say, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian and I 
say the Lord's Prayer before I go to sleep at night. And I say my prayers over lunch. And, and we don't take it any, serious, any more seriously. You know, yesterday's faith might not be enough for today's Christianity. And, and, and this is what he says. Otherwise, people are going to see your foundation that you weren't able to finish it, and they're going to ridicule you. See, if we haven't calculated the cost and we call ourselves a Christian, the non-Christians are going to say, I thought you were a Christian. At least they used to say that to me all the time. Okay? They love to say that to you. Because they know what it means to be a Christian. And half-hearted followers, they're not going to build any towers. They're not going to win any wars. And this is what Jesus says, and I close. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all your possessions. Oh, man. We talked about possessions last week, didn't we? I like my stuff. And we're the most materialistic society that you can imagine. Does he really want us to give all of our stuff to uh, the Hope Center? Which, by the way, is five miles down at mile marker um, 14. Okay. No. But is your stuff available for God to use? Is your car available to, to haul stuff down to feed the poor or to take somebody who's hurting to a doctor's appointment or to pick up some friends and, and, and bring them over for dinner so you can have an intentional friendship with a little Christianity involved? Are you, are you, is your stuff what you live for? Is your stuff what you enjoy and, and freely share? Remember the rich young ruler? He wasn't willing to give up his stuff. And I think he missed out on the adventure of faith. Here's a guy that could have had the experience of raising the dead and seeing miracles and experiencing the actual presence of God on earth. But he held on to his stuff. What a hollow life. Are you living a hollow life? Or are you saying, you know what, I like this stuff, but I like Jesus more. Because Jesus has a lot more to give you than your stuff will ever bring satisfaction to you.